All right. Well, our first topic for this evening has to do with questions about homosexuality. And so we're going to talk about it from two different um, angles. We're going we're to look at what the Bible says, and then we're going to look ab- at what we, what we do with that in terms of how we interact with um, friends, family, or others that we might come in contact with, or have contact with, um, who are homosexual. And what does that look like? What is that interaction supposed to look like? How should we go about doing that? Um, and we'll we'll just see how our time goes, and we'll we'll uh, work our way through it. Let's begin with the scriptural uh, topic of homosexuality, homosexual behavior or activity, and we'll talk about that as well if we have time. Um, so let me ask you, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Okay, where does it say that? Leviticus, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, so there are two, two chapters in there that deal with that. Paul says um, a couple, of, actually three Three places in the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 1. So Paul says it three times. Um, those are the main ones. And there are a couple of other verses here and there that if we have time, we'll, we may look at some of those as well. But those are, those are the ones, those are the main verses. So we have some Old Testament and some New Testament that speak to this particular issue. The question is, what does it say and how does it say it? And what does that mean, especially from an Old Testament standpoint coming forward? But before we get there, we should probably look in Genesis 1 and 2. Because in Genesis 1 and 2, in the creation account, we have some things that are given to us there that are of particular importance when it comes to human sexuality. What does Genesis 1 and 2 tell us about the creation of humanity? Okay, Genesis, Genesis 1 tells us that God created man, it's in humanity, in his image. Male and female, he created them. So Genesis 1 gives us that overview, that God created humankind, male and female. There's a distinction between the two, but they are both created in the image of God. Chapter 2 then elaborates on that. And how, what does it tell us about the creation of woman in chapter 2? Okay. Go on, you guys know this. <laughs> So Genesis 2, God looks at man. So Genesis 1 tells us that they were created. So we, would, we get the impression from Genesis 1 that they're created at the same time. Genesis 2 tells us, no, that was a summary. Here's the way that it happened. So God created Adam first, and he looks at Adam and says, it's good, but it is not good that he's alone. So he brings all the animals before Adam, and Adam names them all, and no suitable helper was found for Adam among the animal kingdom. And so God does something, but he doesn't create woman the same way he created man. He doesn't create Eve the way he created Adam. From Adam, he goes to the dust and forms him and then breathes into him. Okay, how does he create Eve? Takes a rib. Puts Adam to sleep, takes her rib. What's the implication there? Okay, they are of the same 
substance. They're of the same origin substance. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're, we won't even get into headship and those kinds of things at this point. We can get into that later. But there is, there is something significant about woman being taken out of man for both their being of the same substance, the same essence in that sense, but also the completeness that they bring to each other when they come together. That was part of the aloneness that God is going to provide a helper suitable for him. And so he takes out of him and then brings her back to him and there's a completeness there. Then we have to go back to chapter 1 because chapter 1 says he created them and then he gave them instructions. What were they to do? Be fruitful and multiply. They were to have dominion over the earth, but they were also to be fruitful and multiply. And then when they come back together after being parted and brought back together there in chapter 2, Adam can say, this is bone of my, flesh, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Is that significant? It's hugely significant in a lot of different ways. But what is established here in Genesis chapter 2, in that it goes on to say that a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, in the fulfillment of chapter 1, the be fruitful and multiply part, the procreative aspect of the man-woman duality that Adam needs this other part of himself back in order to procreate in fulfillment of the mandate, the command that God had given them in the garden. And so there's a whole lot going on here just in terms of um, the, the symbolism of the way this is done. So, there are similarities shared in the origin of the two of them, but they are different in that Adam recognizes this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, but she shall be called woman, not man. He is man, she is something different. So there are similarities, but there are also differences. And Adam acknowledges both of those here in the creation account. So the two become one flesh, they are fruitful and multiply. So there's the unique sexual union and procreative function of male and female in the, the way that God created here in Genesis 1, as it's explained in Genesis 1 and 2, emphasizing different parts of it. Why do we go here? Why should we start here when we're talking about homosexuality? Because homosexuality isn't mentioned here. This is God's design for man and woman, for marriage, for reproduction, for family, the whole thing. This is the way God designed it, this is the way He created it. And so, if we're going to talk about human sexuality, we need to start with the way God designed it so that we understand what it should look like moving forward. So God designed it very specifically in this way to fulfill His purposes uniquely for His creation. And this, this is where we have to start. Okay, thoughts or questions? Okay. Yeah.
referring to the vegetable does not become a social hazard that is today in the state of Arkansas. So you saying all this to them is irrelevant. Right. And we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. So, yeah, when we get through the rest of them, then we'll talk about their objections. Right, right, yeah, yeah, and hopefully we'll have time to get get to that. Okay, the next the next time this or the first time really that the issue of homosexuality homosexuality comes up is Sodom and Gomorrah in um, Genesis nineteen, where the one of the issues of the sinfulness of Sodom and Gomorrah is the homosexuality that is being perpetrated and trying to be perpetrated here um, on, on these men. None of what's happening here is good, which is why God is going to bring fire down on them and destroy them. That's, that's the whole point. But one of the big issues is the homosexuality that is here. Um, it is called an abomination. It is a sexual sin. Any questions on that? It's pretty straightforward. Now, some object, they go to Ezekiel chapter 16, where Ezekiel talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and he talks about the sin there being, home, being a hospitality, not sexual sin. But in the, if you read the full context of Ezekiel, he's talking to the Jews in exile, and the, the point he's making is a little bit different. He's not excluding the homosexuality. He's just emphasizing a particular part about hospitality for the people there. Was hospitality an issue here in Sodom and Gomorrah? It was. They were trying to rape people, which is not a hospitable act, right? They're, they're trying to, to execute violence on people, on strangers who come into town. That is not hospitality. Now, Ezekiel doesn't preclude the homosexuality or sexual sins or any of those things. He's just emphasizing a particular part of it. If we go also to Jude, verse 7, there's only one chapter in Jude, so just verse 7. He says, just as in Sodom and Gomorrah, as they indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, they're undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. What does he mean by strange flesh? A man going after not a woman, it would be strange in that way, flesh here being in the terms of um, the, the pursuit of sex, strange in that it is not the ordained, natural kind of um, activity that would be expected. So Jude understands it to be talking here, to be uh, linking Sodom and Gomorrah and their destruction, their eternal destruction with um, homosexual activity. But this is the first place that it shows up. We then move on to Leviticus chapter 18. Which in verse 22 tells us, you shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. Is that pretty straightforward? So lie with is one of the ways that the Old Testament, the Hebrew especially, it's a euphemism for sexual activity. Uh, lie with or knew, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore a son. Um, lie with is certainly understandable in terms of the, the metaphor idea here, the... the um, the use of the, uh, the word here. So this one is pretty straightforward. It, it is in the midst of what is sometimes referred to as the holiness code in Leviticus, which is the instructions from God to Moses, from Moses to the people. This is how you are to live. Because I am holy, you should be holy. This is how you are to live in relationship with me as my people. And there are several things that are uh, talked about there, but in chapter 18, there is a lot here about sex. In fact, the bulk of the chapter is about sex. Now, why is that necessary? Right. 
Okay. Does God have a design for sex? And what is it? One man, one woman, in a covenant relationship, which we call marriage. Is that it? Yes, that's it. One man, one woman, in a covenant marriage relationship. That is where sex is designed to be. Anything outside of that is forbidden. But God needs to define some things for his people. And so he does. First he talks about the relationships or the people that you could marry. And so, and therefore have sex with. So he talks about what we would call incest. You can't marry, you can't have sex with close relationships. Your children, your sisters or brothers, your aunts and uncles, your mother or father-in-law, um, stepchildren, step-parents. He walks through, there are about 13 verses where he walks through that. What we would classify as incest. That's where we get the idea of incest and that it's wrong. From Leviticus 18. It's just been copied down and passed down through um, legal history. So here we have God clearly, you cannot, here, here are the forbidden groups of people in that sense. Then he talks about um, your neighbor's wife, obviously, which would fall under adultery. Um, then he talks about child sacrifice in terms of procreation and so forth. Then he talks about, verse 22, homosexuality. You should not lie with a man as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Then he talks about bestiality. You may not have sex with animals. And then he goes on to some other things. So, we have an entire chapter here devoted to defining and outlining for them. Now, if they have Genesis 1 and 2, why would they need Leviticus 18? Things have happened since Genesis 1 and 2, and questions have come up, as well as the innate sinfulness of people. And so God defines for them very clearly. Lest there is any question, let me define for you clearly how this should work. And he outlines it for them here. Okay. Leviticus 20, verse 13 says, If a man lies with a man, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. So he goes a little bit further here. And defining again what is an abomination here, homosexual, sexual activity, um, and then who's guilty? Both of them. And the punishment, they're both to be put to death. So, is Leviticus clear? Is it pretty straightforward? It is. And a straightforward reading of it of these two verses in their context, you come to that, that same conclusion. It's clear, it's straightforward, its meaning is clear all the way around. Revisionists argue that, um, some of them try to argue that what is meant here or what is in view here is temple prostitution, especially in Leviticus 18. But Leviticus 18 is about sexual sins that are forbidden. It's not about... Um, worship practices. So it's about incest and adultery and, and homosexuality and bestiality. It's, a, it's about sexual practices across the board. It's not about idolatry and prosti temple prostitution and worship practices in that setting. Um, so it's not connected to any of those things. So it's going that direction, saying that it just, uh, it's, it's not about homosexuality in general, it's just about temple prostitution doesn't fit the context of chapter 18. Uh, others argue that this is non-monogamous homosexuality, um, promiscuous sex. But the commands regarding incest are very, very detailed. There are 13 verses there detailing 
clearly, not this, not this, not this, not this, not this, not this, going into very detail. The command against homosexuality, against adultery, against bestiality are all blanket statements because there doesn't need to be any more detail. It covers all adultery, all bestiality, all homosexuality. If he wanted to be detailed about them to make distinctions as he did with the incest commands, he could have, but he details where he needs to and makes blanket statements where he needs to. So all bestiality, we don't need any details there. Just all of it is wrong. All adultery, he doesn't need to give us any clarifications there. This is adultery, and then this, and then this person, and then this. If it's not the person you're married to, it's adultery. We can make a blanket statement about that. Homosexuality, he makes another blanket statement. Why? Because it's all homosexuality. Whether it's temple prostitution or something else, promiscuous or monogamous or whatever, if it's homosexual activity, it's an abomination. Okay, so that is Leviticus. Any questions? It it doesn't um, it it doesn't here it doesn't specify woman on woman but it would have been understood that way because most of most all of the commands in the Old Testament are written as, to a man and they are then understood to be applied to everybody so you couldn't argue your way out of well I I, I murdered someone but it says a man should not kill another man, and I'm a woman, so therefore it doesn't apply to me. You couldn't make that argument. It was just written to as a man, but it was understood that it applied to from the men on down to everybody sideways and everybody else. Yeah. Right. Right. The, the, the introduction of temple prostitution is a, is a leap there because it doesn't contextually make any sense because n- nothing else in there is, is speaking of that. Um, and so it, it is a contextual leap to bring that in. They bring that in because they want to deny the blanket statement part of it. And they want to be able to say, some homosexuality is okay, but they can't say all homosexuality is okay because clearly the Bible says, and they're recognizing this is a clear statement. So we can't deny this statement unless we just want to you know, say we don't care what the Bible says. So if they're, wa- if they're wanting to hold to, or at least try to hold to the Bible or look like they're trying to hold to the Bible, they've got to redefine the statement and so what they've done is they've looked around and said okay there was temple prostitution and so clearly in other places the bible says temple prostitution is wrong and and the people of god should not engage in that so if if we say that that is what this is about then we then other homosexual activity would still be okay because that was not about homosexuality, it was about worship practice. And that's what they're trying to do, get the, get the focus off of homosexuality and onto some other aspect. There weren't supposed to be, but there were a couple of times that we know about. But yeah, there weren't supposed to be. that answer your question?
Right, they they wouldn't say it that way, but they're they're even misunderstanding the history of it. Yeah, but that's that is the argument they would make. Yes, yes, yeah, and we'll talk more about that when we get can, when we fold in the New Testament because they make the same argument there. Yep. Okay, that takes us to Romans chapter 1. So, is the Old Testament clear? Se- seems to be, right? And, well, to us, yes. And, and, to, and, to, and to the other side, it's clear to them too. And... They admit that in a couple of different ways. Some of them come out and admit it. Some, some of the even pro-homosexual um, scholars and, and so forth say very clearly, the Bible is very clear that homosexuality is an abomination. And then they say something like, but, and go on to something else. And we'll, if we have time, we'll talk about some of that. But it's, I mean, the Old Testament is clear. The question is then, what do we do with it? So let's address that issue first. So some people say, okay, so Leviticus is clear, but Leviticus doesn't count anymore because we're not under the law. So does it apply? And the Christian answer is, Okay, that's the correct response. Are we under the Old Testament law? No. So Levitic, does Leviticus 18 or Leviticus 20 apply? No. It doesn't. Because we're not under the Mosaic Covenant. Are we? Okay, are we under the Ten Commandments? Part of the Mosaic Covenant. Now, did we just mess up? No, because all of it, all of the Mosaic Covenant is repeated in the New Testament. So we're not under the Mosaic Covenant, we're under the New Covenant, which takes the entire Mosaic Covenant and repeats it. It just interprets it through Jesus. So, for example, if we go to the first seven chapters of Leviticus, it's all about the sacrifices and offerings that we bring. Do we bring sacrifices, sheep and goats and so forth? No. Why not? Because Jesus is the sacrifice, once for all. So does the sacrifice continue under the new covenant? Yes, it's just Jesus, not an animal that we bring. It's the shedding of his blood, not the shedding of the animal blood. Do they have pre- high priest in the Old Testament? Yes, Leviticus talks about the high priest. So does Exodus and Deuteronomy and all. Do we have a high priest in the New Testament? Yes, it's not a, it's a one, now only one high priest. Jesus is the high priest. They have other priests in the Old Testament, in the Mosaic Covenant. Do we have priests in the New Covenant? Do this. Who's the priest? We are. Okay. There's a temple. Is there a temple in the New Covenant? Yes, we are the temple. The Holy Spirit, the presence of God here on earth resides not at the Holy of Holies, but in believers. So all of the Ten Commandments are repeated. What about the Sabbath? Do we keep the Sabbath? Yes, but we don't call it the Sabbath. How, how does Paul tell us to keep the Sabbath? 
It's the any day you want to worship God is the Sabbath. It's just not tied to a specific day anymore. What about all the food laws in the Old Testament? What was the purpose of the food laws in the Old Testament? To set them apart, to make them different in a particular way externally. Are we to be set apart? Yes, we are. We can eat anything because the food now does, would the food set us apart now? No, because the church, in, in the Old Testament, Israel was a nation distinct from the others as a unit. In the New Testament, where's the church? In every nation. So what would difference would eating different food make? It wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't set us apart at all. Because we're now in all of the nations. But we are to be sanctified. We are to be set apart in other ways. And so all of the Mosaic Covenant, we're not under any of it, but it's all repeated in the New Testament. And so where, where do we see the homosexuality prohibition from the Leviticus and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and all that repeated in the New Testament? Well, it begins in Romans. Romans chapter 1. What does Paul tell us? Because they rejected God... He gave them over to a depraved mind, and what did they do? They exchanged the natural function, women for women and men for men. Uh, Romans 1, 26, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for the women exchanged the natural function, and in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Okay, what's he telling us? What are the key words that he uses? Because the revisionists will say the key words here are burning in their desire toward one another. The men were burning in the desire. And so the problem that Paul is talking about is not general homosexuality. It's promiscuous, unbridled homosexuality. And that committed, monogamous, loving homosexuality is okay because what Paul is talking about here is this burning desire. That's the problem. That's not the key word in the, in the passage. What's the key word that's, that's repeated in both verses 26 and 27? The natural function. Where does that connect us back to? Genesis 1 and 2. That's why we started there. We start there because we need to understand what God created sex to be. And what is Paul talking about? They exchanged the rightful, created, natural function... For something else, what Jude calls pursuing strange flesh. That's the key, because it's repeated in both verses. Women with women is unnatural. Men with men is unnatural. The burning desire part is just the sinful part of what happens when we sin. James explains that clearly to us. But the key point here is the natural part. They exchanged what is natural, what is God created, for something that is not natural, man created. And that's the whole point here. They, they rejected the worship of God and putting God in his rightful place, and they chose instead to worship the creation and put us, mankind, ourselves, in that place that we exchanged the natural created order for an, a man-made unnatural order. And that's the point that Paul is making here. Questions or thoughts? Yeah. God gave them over? Yeah. yeah. So... And, and this, is, this is the interesting part of all of this, but 
what did, what did they do? They knew God, and they rejected God, and so what happened? God let them go. God, God based, you know, took his hand off and let them, if you turn that way and go down that road, and God lets you go, off you go. And then it goes on, he goes on to detail, this is what, these are the results that happened. So God gave them over, is the, the sinfulness is there, what are we called to do with our sinfulness? Repent. Which means, literally, turn around. Now what happened here? They headed off in the wrong direction, denied God, turned their back on God, headed off in the wrong direction. What they needed to do, repent and turn around. God let them go. So he's using this whole metaphor. God let them go, and that's the result of that path. So he gave them over in that sense of, gave them the results of what they wanted. All right, 1 Corinthians 6 is the next New Testament passage. Verses 9 and 10, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, etc., etc., shall inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. What's the point? This group of people will not what? Inherit the kingdom of God. Meaning... <laughs> they are not in the kingdom of God which means they are not saved, which means they go where? To hell. To hell. Those, right, because there are only two destinations, right? In the kingdom or out of the kingdom? Heaven or hell? In the presence of God, not in the presence of God. Those are the only two eternal destinations that the Bible gives us. And so that's what we have to work with. Okay, so this, this group of people not in the kingdom of God. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals. Is that a general statement or a particular one? It, it's a general one in terms of the categories. It's particular if you want to say that in terms of the specifics of it, but... Okay. So it appears here, Paul is listing kind of a a group of sexual sins, fornicators, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals. Um, these are all behaviors that's in the lifestyle of engaging in this activity. And this is what, this is what trips up some Christians sometimes. Because could some of these things in verses 9 and 10 be used to describe Christians. Not as a lifestyle. Okay. Yes, because then in 11, he goes on to explain that, doesn't it? And such were some of you. You lived this lifestyle. Now, do Christians still sin? What happens when you sin as a Christian? You repent. You turn from that, you reject that, and you turn back to God. You don't live a lifestyle of adultery or murder or stealing or gossip or anger. Pick a sin. doesn't matter what the sin is. The list of, of things here, I mean, Paul could expand this list, but he gives this particular list in 9 and 10 because if you, go through the, if you read through the book of 1 Corinthians, these things are specific to them and where they are. They're dealing with sexual sins and they're dealing with the sins of um, surrounding the the body of Christ in communion and so forth. And so these, this list is particular to them, but he could have included other sins if he was talking to a different group of people. But a lifestyle of sin is what he's talking about. 
He's talking about these behaviors that characterize who you are. So, he then concludes that with verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed. Okay. The next one is 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to run out of time. Where he says, um, again, another kind of was those who are lawless and rebellious, ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane, homosexuals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, contrary to the sound teaching according to the glorious gospel. And so here he's following, um, because he's speaking to Timothy here, not to a particular church. He follows more of a Ten Commandments kind of idea. The Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, Eighth, and Ninth Commandments show up here in a row. Um, But again, this idea of if these things characterize you, and this is what the law was for, to point these things out, but if these things are characterizing you, then you're not in keeping with the gospel. Okay, so I know we're going fast here. So the Old Testament was clear. Is the New Testament clear? Okay, it seems, seems pretty straightforward. And again, none of, the, none of the people on the other side of the debate who are pro-homosexual in some fashion, none of them who are serious deny this. They all recognize the Old Testament and the New Testament are pretty clear that homosexuality is a sin. They then try to get around it in a number of different ways. Um, But anyone who denies that the Bible is clear on the topic of homosexuality is not seriously reading the Bible. Okay, let's talk about a few objections. One objection that you might hear is that the Bible says very little about homosexuality. Is that true? It is. I mean, we, you know, if we listed off the verses, that's not very many verses considering the entire Bible. Right? We've got two verses in Leviticus. We've got two verses in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. We've got one verse in 1 Timothy. We've got a couple of verses in Romans. We've got, you know less than 10 verses throughout the whole of Scripture. Okay. Does that matter? No, it doesn't. Is the Bible clear about what it says when it says this? Yes. And that's the important part. The second thing to consider about this is that, for example, the Bible says a lot about money. So why does it say a lot about money and not very much about homosexuality? Well, in the Old Testament setting and in the first century New Testament setting, in the nation of Israel and in the church, homosexuality wasn't an issue. They all understood homosexuality was a sin. So you didn't need to say that repeatedly. That was well understood and accepted by everyone. Money was a whole other issue. There were lots of thoughts and temptations and different ideas about money, and so a lot needed to be said about money. Now, the Bible has quite a bit to say about the the general concept of sexual immorality. That comes up quite a bit, because that's another area. For example, going back to Leviticus, he spends 13 verses talking about incest, because we need to be really clear about all of this. He only needs to say homosexuality is is an abomination. He only needs to say that one time. Everybody got that. So just because the Bible doesn't talk about something a lot doesn't mean that it doesn't address the issue or have something to say, and it doesn't mean that it isn't clear and that it isn't something important. It may be like this. How many times does he say, do not murder? Well, he doesn't need to say that a whole lot. That's a pretty clear statement, and everybody generally understands that, and we don't have to repeat it. So, when 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 the death of someone is okay or condoned rather than murder, yes, yeah, because we do have to distinguish between the two. Yeah. Um, 
Some people, a, a kind of a, a corollary to this argument is, why do Christians, why do you guys talk about homosexuality so much? What is your obsession with this and so forth? Well, and the answer to that one is very clear. We didn't talk about this one until the culture started talking about this one. The culture brought it up and tried to make it, normalize it and push it on into the church and everywhere else. We had to respond. So we didn't choose to talk about this topic. We're responding to what the culture is doing. Um, so there's the flip side of that argument a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay, so another objection is, what about divorce, adultery, pick a sin? But oftentimes, divorce, adultery, those kinds of things will come up. Now, is there a point there? There is if we, as the church, focus in on one sin to the exclusion of other sin. If we're doing that, then we have a problem, and we need to address that. If we've normalized and accepted divorce just because it's common and it's something that happens to people that we like and know well, but we don't accept this sin because it, it's not one that we struggle with, that's a problem. And that sometimes there's some truth in that. And so we as the church, we as believers need to be careful that we are not calling out homosexuality or some other transgenderism or something just because it's something out there and we're not dealing with our own sin. Absolutely. We do. We can't, we can't rail against abortion and beat our wives and think everything's okay. Or gossip and be okay with that. We, we have to deal with all sin um, but at the same time, does that make abortion or homosexuality any less a sin? It doesn't. So it doesn't negate that those are sins. So calling out, you know, the log and the speck idea, there's some truth in that, but it doesn't mean, but it goes on to say, get the log out of your own eye, Why? So then you can help the other person get the speck out of their eye. It's not just ignore the speck and go deal with your own log. Both are still sins. But yes, that is, that is something that we have to be careful of. Yeah. Right. That, is, that is true. And there are, there are some issues like that that we have, to, we have to be biblical about how we approach them. Yeah. Uh, we talked for a little bit about um, the abusive homosexual practices. This is one that comes up that talks about the Bible didn't know anything about monogamous, loving, homosexual relationships. So it is only talking about abusive, um, some, a man in power abusing his authority or man, pederasty, man with boy, um, those kinds of things. First of all, as we've looked, that's not the way it's presented in any of the scriptures. There were Greek words for pederasty and these other things. Those are not the words that the New Testament or the Old Testament use. They use the general words for homosexuality. And the context are general prohibition against what? All homosexual behavior. So the contexts are clear. Secondly, that, uh, that objection is historically wrong. We have, they're looking at particular um, references, but if you go back and look in the, at, the, at all of the historical references, especially in the first century period, because we have quite a few of them, 
they knew of every kind of homosexual activity that exists today or has ever existed, from abusive relationships to long-term monogamous relationships. They, they had all of that. And so Paul, when he's writing this, knows all of those exist. And there's language to talk about all of them. So if he had wanted to allow some forms and exclude other forms, there was language for him to do that. He doesn't do that. He says homosexual activity, homosexual behavior across the board. So that, that's, a, that's an attempt to, again, get around what is clear in Scripture, but it's not scriptural and it's not even historically accurate. Um, it's, it's just a wrong idea all the way around. You may also hear, isn't the church supposed to be a place for broken people or a place of love and grace and mercy? How do we respond to that? Yes, absolutely, 100%. But it's also a place of truth. And it's a place for believers What about unbelievers? It's a place for them to come, but they're not part of the body, are they? It's also a place for what does the love, grace, and mercy demand or entail? Repentance, discipline of the Lord, obedience, All of those things together. So what they've done is they've taken love, grace, and mercy out of Scripture and redefined them, and now they're trying to put them back in. This idea of unconditional love, grace, and mercy, accept me as I am because you're supposed to be loving and gracious and merciful. That's not what Scripture says, is it? What did 1 Corinthians 6.11 say? Such were some of you, but... You were washed, you were justified, you were cleaned, you were sanctified. I mean, we could go all over Scripture and and look at those things, couldn't we? What does Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? No one, who's here to throw the first stone? No one? Neither do I contend you. Go and sin no more. We forget that part. We just want to stop right before that. But he says, go and sin no more. You've been confronted with the mercy of God. Now, repent. He doesn't say that, but he doesn't have to because it's clear the implication. Repent, go and sin no more. Jesus does this all the time. You will know the tree by its fruit. John 15, abide in me and I in you, or... The branches that don't abide get cut off and thrown in the fire. That doesn't sound very loving and gracious and merciful and all that. But it is because what's the alternative? We're going to be gracious as you go to hell. But we were really gracious about it. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's right. It's ridiculous. So, don't, don't, don't get that backwards in your head. Don't redefine love and grace and mercy. Keep them biblical words with biblical definitions so that they are meaningful. Um, well, another objection. It's not fair. Because if we condemn, if we label homosexuality a sin, we've relegated same-sex attracted people to a life of chastity without hope. Well, maybe, but let's say they didn't. What do we do with that? They can still get married to who? Okay, to a person of the opposite sex. They're just choosing not to, right, okay. Yes. I don't think you really can argue against it. You just got to call it for what it is. 
Well, let's deal, let's deal with the argument of it's not fair. Let's start there. Okay, what do we do with it's not fair? Well, life's not fair, but what is fairness, what is, what is fairness based on? Fairness is based on our feelings. Fairness is based on how I feel about something. It's not justice. Justice is different. Justice and fairness are not the same thing. Fairness is from my perspective how I feel about something. It's not fair that my brother got a larger piece of cake, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not based on justice. God is just. Everything will work out justly according to God's plan and God's character. Fairness is about my feelings. Now, where do my feelings fall in terms of how God feels about my feelings? They don't come into account, do they? God's word is the truth, and when my feelings run headlong into it, the truth stands and my feelings don't matter in that sense. Or at least they're not taken into account. So there's that part of it. Another consideration here is fairness isn't really an issue, but it's the exact same thing that God requires of every human being. What does God require of all of us sexually? He requires abstinence except in a male female one man one woman marriage outside of that what does God require no sexual activity there are heterosexual and there are homosexual people who are single and what's required of them the same thing some are single by choice, some are not. And some don't like it. And they want to be married, and they're not. And some people were married and now aren't married, not by their own choice. What's required of them? Abstinence, because sexuality is only expressed biblically inside a one-man, one-woman marriage. So it is, I mean, everybody's under the same requirement. And so if you want to engage in sexual activity, where do you do it? Inside one man, one woman, a monogamous, committed, biblical idea of marriage. That's the way God designed it. Anything outside of that, the same thing is required of everybody. So, yes? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and so there's there's a there's a larger conversation to be had there. But there's a difference between friendship and relationship that kind of romantic relationship. And if it is a romantic relationship just without sex, that's still not a good thing. I mean, yes, they're, they're abstaining from sex, that's good, but the romantic part of it is... Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that too, but it's, yeah, that's not, that's not a good idea. I'm sorry? Right. Right, so you know, it, it, would take us, it would take us back to um, you know, Matthew when Jesus is talking about, you've heard it say, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you lust after a woman, it's what's going on in here. If you, if you don't murder but you hate, it's still an issue. Yes, 
We, we, would, we would do the same thing if it was opposite sex, if it was male-female relationship. We're gonna be in a committed, loving relationship, living in the same house together. We're just not going to engage in physical intimacy. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. How long is that gonna last? Um, but even if they, even if we, even if we said, okay, we believe you, still not a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk for just a minute because we're out of time. Let's talk just a minute about how we deal with people personally. How should we respond to homosexual people? So to speed this along, let me do, let me do this. It depends on whether they're Christians or non-Christians. Because I would, resp- I, would, I would categorize we respond to the two groups differently. How do you respond to a non-Christian who is engaged in homosexual activity or thinks they're homosexual or any, anything in that range? Is the homosexuality the issue? What's the issue? Jesus is the issue, right? The gospel is the issue. So what do we want to do with a non-Christian? We can take the homosexuality out of it, put put any sin you want in place of it. Because the issue isn't the sin or the lifestyle, the issue is salvation. And so that's how we need to approach the non-Christian who is engaged in homosexuality or struggling with it or whatever, just as we would with anyone else. We need to engage them with the gospel. We need to engage them in a relationship that is expressing the grace of God and the love of God. The truth, because you can't get to the gospel without the truth. But not stop the homosexuality and then, because that doesn't work, does it? Clean yourself up and then you can come to Christ. Clean yourself up and... No. So... With a non-Christian, we approach them that way. With a, someone who claims to be a Christian and is engaged in or struggling with homosexuality or whatever the particulars are. Now, that's a different story, isn't it? Because homosexuality is clearly incompatible with Scripture and therefore incompatible with Christianity, with your Christian life. And so can we approach them the same way we would the non-Christian? You could if you're making an assessment as to whether they are a believer or not, which is a valid point. Because we do need to make it, we need to go, so first it might be to go to James 2, 14 to 26. You say you have faith, but I don't see any works, so I question your faith that might be where the conversation starts or something along that line. You say you're a Christian, but your, your life doesn't seem to be in keeping with biblical truth. Can we talk about that? Because it's, it, has been, it has become increasingly common for people to call themselves gay Christians. If you have to put any adjective before Christian, there is a problem. Just as the same thing, if you have to put any, any adjective before justice, there's a problem. Justice is justice. There's no social justice or this justice. Or th- there's just justice. Just like there's just Christianity. You don't put... I am an adultering Christian. I am a gossiping Christian. I am a fill-in-the-blank Christian. No, we don't put any sin before the label Christian, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, that's okay. No. I am a Christian. Now, if it's a person who says, I am a Christian, but I am struggling with this particular sin, that's a different issue. And we would approach that person a little, uh, in a, com- a little bit different way. Because we, we understand that. Because we could all say, I am a Christian who is struggling with whatever the sin is. 
So we've got maybe three categories of people. Unbelievers, we approach them, our, the purpose is the gospel. The purpose is conversation, evangelism, trying to help them come to faith in Jesus Christ. You've got the person who claims to be a Christian who may or may not be, we may need to explore that. We don't have to beat them over the head, gently but firmly, truth with love, but truth. Let's explore. You're claiming to be a follower of Christ, but your lifestyle doesn't look like it. Let's talk about that. And then you've got the Christian who seems to be a legitimate Christian who is struggling with and admitting, I'm struggling with this. And that would be a discipleship issue, a sanctification issue in terms of let me come alongside and see what help we can, you know, how I can help you move forward with this. Then you deal with them as false teachers. You kick them out or cut them off or call them out or, I mean, depending on the context of how you come across them, but we reject false teachers. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So if you've got, I know there's lots of stuff and we went really fast, so if you've got follow-ups or anything like that, um, you can come talk to me or you can email me or text me or write them down and we can follow up with those. Because um, we went really fast, but hopefully it was coherent. Let me pray for us. Lord, we do thank you and pray that you would give us grace and mercy, compassion 